Now, this is interesting, too. Newton, the very person uh, who was spoken about, is, in his third book, assumes the hypothesis of the Earth's movement. The authors who edit his book, the Catholic authors who edit his book, uh, say this, but we profess obedience to the decrees made by the supreme pontiffs against the movement of the earth. Now that's interesting. You see, Newton may have held sway with Europe about heliocentrism, but he wasn't convincing the people in the upper grades of the Catholic Church, namely these two editors. The Jesuit edition remains the most ambitious and perhaps the most useful edition ever published. It was reissued in Geneva in 1760, Prague in 1785, and finally in Glasgow in 1822 and 1833, which is not too long ago when you think about it, okay? And here's the disclaimer, the declaratio, they call it. It's all in Latin. Here's the uh, front cover of, of uh, Newton's book, Principia Mathematica. Here's the 1833 Glasgow edition of Newton's Principia Mathematica. And here's the disclaimer right inside the front cover. Second page you turn to has the disclaimer on it, okay? <laughs> so we're not abiding by what Newton says. We just have to analyze it because we were told to do so, but we give our allegiance to the supreme pontiffs. Now, this is a very interesting wrinkle in the whole issue, the issue around Canon Satelli under Pope Pius VII. Pope Pius VII was incarcerated in Florence by Napoleon from 1809 to 1814. The Vatican became a Napoleonic police state. Napoleon confiscated all documents dealing with the Galileo trial, took them to France. The documents were not returned until 1843, okay, almost three decades later. In France, everyone was free to be a heliocentrist, per Lazari, because that's where he was from. Now, Canon Giuseppe Satelli, from his own diary, he writes that his book, The Elements of Astronomy, which treated heliocentrism as a thesis, as a fact, was disproved by the master of the sacred palace, Filippo Enfassi. Satelli then appealed to Pius VII to confront uh, Enfassi's decision. Since all the Galileo records had been confiscated by Napoleon, Pius VII could only go by what Benedict XIV did in 1758. But Benedict XIV had kept on the index the condemnation of Copernicus, Foscarini, Zuniga, Kepler, and Galileo for treating heliocentrism as a thesis. So they had a problem to deal with. Maurizio Benedetto Olivieri, commissary general of the index in 1820, thought up a scheme to get Satelli's book an imprimatur. <coughs> Olivieri ignored the church's trial against Galileo and dealt only with Copernicus. In dealing with Copernicus, Olivieri claimed that the popes and sacred congregations of 1616 and 1633 had condemned Copernicanism not because it said the earth went around the sun, but only because Copernicus said it orbited in a perfect circle instead of an ellipse, which was a lie, okay? It was a lie. But did you ever read anything about the church in 1616, 1633, talking about ellipses as the rationale for condemning Copernicanism? Not a word. Father Coyne agrees with us. At the recommendation of the cardinals of the Holy Office, in order to resolve the issue and to safeguard the good name of the Holy See, Olivieri devised the following formula. Copernicus was not correct since he observed circular orbits and epicycles. The church was therefore justified on scientific grounds to condemn Copernicanism in 1616 and 1633. Obviously, there was no need to revoke a decree which rejected what was incorrect at the time of the decree. Wow. Have you ever seen such obfuscation of the truth? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> on such an important issue? I mean, the church was very clear. That's why I read those condemnations to you. It says, we are condemning this because it says the sun stays still and the earth moves. They didn't care how you said it moved. You know, they, they don't care whether you said it moved in triangles, you know, or oblongs. It doesn't matter to them. 
If you say the earth moves, that's heretical. That's formally heretical. And Abali Fantoli agrees. I don't have time to read that. He, he agrees with Father Coyne. Olivieri's own words. It is true that it, the index, contains some books, namely the particular books by Copernicus and so on, and there is a reason for leaving these books there, for they belong to the age in which the Earth's motion had not been free from its implication of the devastating mobility. And that devastating mobility is the circles, you see, without ellipses. Oops. Kepler's book which had introduced the concept of the elliptical orbits of the planets to improve the Copernican model, had already been placed on the index in 1664 and was still on in 1835, which was 13 years after the Satelli affair. Wow. Oops, forgot that little fact. Oliver had a second problem. The popes and the sacred congregations of 1616 and 1633 never mentioned anything about elliptical orbits being a criterion for condemning Copernicanism. The church was clear it was condemning Copernicanism and Galileo for holding that the sun was in the center and did not move, that the earth was not in the center and moved. Very simple. Can't get around that. Were imprimaturs ever given under false pretenses? Yeah, we already covered one. Galileo got one from Father Niccolo Riccardi, and then it was rescinded by the Pope himself as formally heretical. So imprimaturs really don't mean anything at all. And you can make mistakes there. If it's given legitimately, it means a lot. But they can be fraudulent, as we have seen. Then there's Gregory the Sixteenth. Prior to becoming Pope, Gregory the Sixteenth, Bartolomeo Capillari served on the Inquisition's 1822 commission that heard Olivieri's arguments about why Copernicus was condemned. He was on the commission, okay? And then he became Pope. And the, the 1835 index was approved in the face of three irregularities. Unproven scientific claims of stellar parallax, an alteration of the historical records of 1616 and 1633, claiming that the Inquisition was only concerned with the lack of elliptical orbits, and three, without rescinding the sentence of Galileo's 1633 trial. Remember Lalande, who tried to uh, exonerate Galileo? He was told by the Inquisition itself that he couldn't do it because the trial had not been reversed. Astrophysicist and historian Owen Gingrich said this, what persuaded the Catholic Church to take Copernicus's book off the index was an ultimately false claim for the discovery of an annual stellar parallax. That is Bradley's discovery of stellar aberration in 1728. It wasn't even stellar parallax. The new edition of the index appearing in 1835 finally omitted the revolution but three years before a convincing stellar parallax observation was at last published. So in other words, he was snookered into taking it off the index because he got false information. But even then, the discovery of a true stellar parallax by Friedrich Bessel in 1838 did not prove heliocentrism since the geocentric model, as we discovered today, can explain it just as well. Regarding Galileo's 1633 trial and sentence in 1765, when French astronomer, as I said before, Lalande sought to have Galileo's name removed from the index, he was told by the, he, by the head of the congregation of the index that no such removal was possible until the sentence given to Galileo at the trial of 1633 was formally and officially rescinded. In 1850, the Vatican supports the decision against Galileo. Marino Marini, prefect of the Vatican Secret Archives, was commissioned by the Vatican to write an updated apologetic work on the Galileo affair. The book's title was Galileo e la Inquisizione, Galileo and the Inquisition, and was published by the press of the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith in Rome. Marini's purpose was to demonstrate that the Catholic Church had saved Europe from heresy. This is in 1850 now, okay? Marini stated, we must affirm that perhaps there has never been a judicial action as just and as wise as this one. Marini paid special attention to the meetings that the Tuscan ambassador, Francesco Nicolini, 
had with Pope Urban VIII in 1632. Remember those conversations I showed you going back and forth where the Pope tried to convince Medici that this was a sinister thing that Galilee was doing? It was upsetting the whole Catholic faith? Well, that's what he's talking about here. And he went over those conversations and recorded them in this book in 1850. Okay? Which is less than 200 years ago. The church was still pushing geocentrism. The Pontifical Academy of Science in 1941 commissioned Pio Paschini, a priest and professor of ecclesiastical history in Rome, to write a biography of Galileo for the third centenary of his death, 1942. It was rejected for publication by both the Academy and the Holy Office, mainly because it was judged to be too favorable to Galileo. It was later published in 19, oops, 1967 after extensive revisions exonerating the church were made in it. Here's John Paul II. We're almost done here. Newspapers around the world. Pope calls for a re-examination of Galileo case and an important speech on science. This comes from 1979, the Challenge newspaper in England. Delivery of the Commission's findings to the 1992 Pontifical Academy of Sciences, judged by the experts. The speech's conclusion was at best neutral. Those waiting to hear an exoneration of Galileo were very disappointed. Ernan McMullen, who teaches right here in Notre Dame, pre, uh, emeritus, editor of the Church in Galileo, 2005, Notre Dame Press said, when the commission was finally wound up in 1992, its achievements fell short of what had been expected from it. And he's an ardent heliocentrist, you see. And he's waiting for the Pope to condemn the church's treatment of Galileo, say it was all a big mistake, and that Galilee was right and the church was wrong. It was never said. That's why he's so disappointed. The final report delivered to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and a speech prepared for the people, for, uh, for the Pope, for delivery on the same occasion were plainly inadequate from the historical standpoint. And in closing, there has admittedly been disappointment, grave disappointment indeed. <laughs> McMullen believes, however, the rejection of by Bellarmine and the qualifiers constituted an objective error on their part as well as on the part of Paul V and the members of the Holy Office who ratified the qualifier's condemnation of the Copernican thesis on the grounds that they were contrary to scripture. Carl Poupard <coughs> was commissioned by Sir John Paul II and thanked him for his work. Poupard began believing that Galileo was right, the church was wrong, but that was changed. And the problem of accusing the church with error in the Galileo case is, well, if we accuse one pope of being wrong about Galileo. Well, what about this pope? Could he be wrong about his conclusions about Galileo too? And yeah, you see what a can of worms you open up? The Challenge newspaper saw this. It says, Pope John Paul has done nothing less than call into question the decisions of his predecessors on the case of Galileo. Many will argue that if his predecessors could be wrong on such an important matter as the relationship between Catholic teaching and science, what guarantee is there that the pope John Paul himself is not wrong in what he teaches? about human rights and other matters. Logical. From pa John Paul II's speech, he says, and we saw this earlier today, it is a duty for theologians to keep themselves regularly informed of scientific advances in order to examine whether or not there are reasons for taking them into account in the reflection or for introducing changes in their teaching. Well, after I just saw Martin Selbretti's uh, presentation here, I would say, I better be informed about those scientific advances that support geocentrism, don't you think? And don't you think those things should change the teaching of these theologians? Well, of course, that's exactly what John Paul II said in his speech in 1992. Is to investigate and accept the evidence for geocentrism, not to ignore and reject it. If they do the former, then scripture, the magisterium, and tradition will be vindicated as the authorities they have been deemed to by all Catholics throughout history. Now, what uh, the experts were calling this, uh, or what the, the people in the Vatican were trying to say in the speech was this. The issue between Galilee and the church was nothing but a tragic mutual incomprehension has been interpreted as the reflection of a fundamental opposition between science and faith. The clarifications furnished by recent historical studies enable us to state that this sad misunderstanding now belongs to the past. So that's how they tried to deal with it. It's just all a big misunderstanding, you see. And then we can just sweep it under the rug and move on. And then another part of the speech said this. 
the emergence of the subject of complexity probably marks in the history of the natural sciences a stage as important as the stage which bears relation to the name of Galileo. When, an un, when a univocal model of order seemed to be obvious, complexity indicates precisely that in order to account for the rich variety of reality, we must have recourse to a number of different models. Yeah. Well, that's relativity, you see? That's relativity. Because they all, we all believe in relativity now, you see? And what does relativity do? Well, it supports either model. That's there, right, get along. <laughs> and what people don't know is that Galileo converted to Catholicism, or converted to uh, geocentrism in the last year of his life, as I read earlier this morning. And so ends the life of Galileo. And that so ends my presentation.